One of the best solutions for helping to coordinate our specialists is to create a market for them to interface with one another and thereby have some opportunity to trade their excess production. <clears throat> and so one of the key financial technologies that was developed very early on, well before we had writing and therefore well before recorded history, uh, was the notion of an exchange network. The idea in an exchange network is that we could have different kinds of specialists who might exchange their products with one another. Now, as we'll explore uh, in next week's series of videos, this can take place in a number of different ways, what I call payment systems. But overall, we find that within any given payment system, the existence of things like transparent and floating prices allows market participants or other specialists to signal to one another exactly how much the effort of any given specialist is worth to them. If we have an open market, for instance, uh, in art, then we can determine whether or not or how, to what extent, a particular painter's effort is valued. If we have an open market in labor, then we can figure out to what extent someone's specialized individual labor is worth. <clears throat> and so as a result, we often try to promote transparent and efficient pricing in markets. However, the real world has a number of opaque and somewhat inefficient markets that exhibit what economists call sticky prices. An example of sticky price is the fact that your wage doesn't fluctuate as the business does better or worse. Your bonus may fluctuate up and down, but a company who does particularly well isn't necessarily going to raise your wage this week or this quarter for that matter. Similarly, a company that finds itself in difficulties might not be in a position to cut back your wages to what they consider an efficient level. Now, <clears throat> These types of markets do have some merits to them. They also have costs, and we shouldn't ignore these extra costs in our search for allocational efficiency. Um, sometimes markets are opaque or frictioned for various reasons, uh, and it is worthwhile for us to keep in mind um, that these are not necessarily things we should do away with. Uh, we tend to have a preference for stable prices, for instance, even though they limit economic allocation, um, because humans tend to be risk averse, and we dislike uncertainty even more than we dislike high and consistent prices in many cases. Now, most of these exchange networks benefit from having some sort of common medium of exchange, uh, a singular kind of good or form of capital that can be traded between the specialists to settle their transactions. And again, we'll be exploring payment systems a little bit more in the next series of videos when we uh, look at the development of things like currency and ledgers to help facilitate the flow of goods between various kinds of specialists. As we'll see then, having a single central good often reduces pricing complexity. Uh, and this, of course, <clears throat> makes the market for every other specialized good more liquid, which means it's a lot easier for me to convert cows into chickens because I sell my cows and I get paid in money. And then I can pay for the chickens I want to buy in money rather than hoping that the person selling chickens wants my cows. Now, <clears throat> while it is helpful, for us to have markets associated with price formation, it's important to recognize that markets also have their own frictions attached to them. We've got costs associated with negotiation between parties, costs associated with a lack of transparency. We've got costs associated with contracting with other counterparties. We've got costs associated with verifying fulfillment or resolving disputes. And so in many cases, what we have done to try to reduce some of the frictions associated with a pure market is to create firms, to <clears throat> effectively contract with a variety of different specific combinations of specialists, uh, and then empower some leader to make decisions by fiat rather than negotiation. This is very, very common throughout human history. For example, in military affairs, we often appoint someone to be a, a warlord or a leader or a commander of a group of forces rather than simply having a mob of 30 or 40 people rush out onto the battlefield to decide what it is they're going to do on their own. They can all individually be specialists with their various kinds of weapon systems, etc. But if they don't coordinate properly, uh, then they're unlikely to succeed at their objectives. And this is why we often have military commanders. Uh, and similar sort of structure, we also have what we would otherwise call business commanders or <clears throat> institutional commanders who can allocate resources uh, by fiat rather than having to negotiate with every individual soldier, for instance, what it is that they're going. Now, of course, this seems very simple. We um, choose a king, and the king decides how resources are going to be allocated. But as anyone who enjoyed Game of Thrones realizes, the possibility of the mad king is very real. Uh, and managerial discretion within organizations does come with its own costs. 
Um, these costs are <clears throat> often related to organizational rigidity, power struggles between various managers, uh, over or under investment, uh, depending on what a manager might prefer compared to the people who's, who are actually supplying the resources. Uh, it can lead to bad acquisitions. It can lead to inefficient capital structures. There are a number of problems that emerge ultimately uh, when we concentrate allocational power in the hands of a single individual, uh, which is what happens when we choose management or when we choose commanders uh, to simply allocate resources by fiat rather than allowing each specialist to negotiate what the value of their effort is. <clears throat> Now, of course, we do have techniques for aligning the interests of the coordinators with the coordinated. Uh, but of course, these are costly as well. Uh, there are no easy solutions that make all of our problems go away at a very low cost. What we effectively do instead is trade one type of costs off against another, hopefully in an optimal way that minimizes the joint cost um, associated with multiple frictions at the same time. Now, one of the ways <clears throat> to try to align interests between the coordinators and the coordinated is simply to provide <clears throat> some kind of carrots or sticks, to provide some kind of incentive that aligns the interests of the coordinators and the coordinated. <clears throat> uh, but there are a number of different techniques we use for this. And so what I would like to discuss uh, over the next couple of minutes uh, is a technique that we use for controlling managerial discretion. Managerial discretion is required in certain cases. We cannot contract for a CEO or for a general for that matter uh, to pre precisely perform prescribed activities in certain cases. In general, these people have these positions because their discretion at a moment's notice is considered valuable. Because it gives us an opportunity to be more rapid in our reactions by having someone who can make these kinds of choices. Nonetheless, because of notions like the Mad King, we often have some kind of governance structure in place to ensure that those people we've empowered to coordinate our specialists are doing so in our best interest. <clears throat> in many cases, uh, these are what are called trustees or directors or supervisory boards of organizations, and it becomes their responsibility to ensure that management is fulfilling its obligations in a way that actually suits the interests of the parties who are providing the resources to be coordinated. In other words, we have a way of overseeing our generals to make sure that the generals aren't just turning themselves into petty warlords and are instead focused on actual national security interests. Similarly, in corporations, we have things like boards of directors to ensure that managers are selecting projects which enhance the overall firm value as opposed to necessarily just providing them uh, with certain kinds of perks or individual kickbacks that they enjoy. Now, in order to get the most from this type of oversight and supervision structure, we have to be very careful about how we select and monitor um, <clears throat> our directors. In general, it's been found that directors should be stakeholders in the organization themselves if we expect them to care about. It. In other words, we're hoping to find directors who will oversee managers who already share the interests of <clears throat> those who are being coordinated. And in that way, they can ensure that the coordinator or the manager uh, is doing so in a way that is mutually beneficial for all parties and not just privately beneficial for the manager. Now, of course, to do that, directors have to understand the nature of the organization. They have to understand what it's trying to accomplish and, of course, what sorts of constraints they labor under. Uh, not all constraints are necessarily bad, but they do impose costs and they do limit the range of reactions that managers or a firm can pursue. Now, in order to ensure that our directors don't simply replace our managers as Mad King and themselves become self-serving, it becomes important for us to have regular and formal reviews of these directors and trustees by the constituents in order to ensure that they're doing their jobs well. Uh, and that means adopting techniques that we don't have very well developed in the 21st century for auditing and supervising those people who are supposed to be watching the watchmen as one final thing that we know is particularly valuable when it comes to the selection of directors or trustees um, is that they should have very few formal financial ties um, to management which could complicate their own decision. Also, they should be of diverse backgrounds to help improve, impede groupthink. We know psychologically that people who all look the same on the outside tend to go along with each other's decisions. Uh, this harkens back to the Stone Age when it was really a matter of identifying people that looked like you 
and believing that they might share your interest. However, <laughs> while this may or may not have been true during the Stone Age, uh, it has created a complicated genetic legacy for us uh, that we often have to fight against. Uh, <clears throat> and we don't fight against this because it makes us feel better. We fight against this because it leads to stupid and poor decisions which is why it's important for us to have a diversity of people on our directors who are advocating the positions of numerous stakeholders within the organization and not simply having all of our <clears throat> allocators and overseers coming from the same kinds of ethnic, age, or gender categories. The more we mix people up, the more they fight, but the more they fight, the better solutions we get in terms of allocation. 